Recently, I attended the Coffee Roasters Guild Retreat in Stevenson, Washington. These retreats are a great opportunity for coffee roasters from all over the world to get together, network with, and learn from each other, and to take various coffee classes from the Guild. This year, I helped instruct two courses, Roast Level Exploration and Can You Taste the Roast System. I'll be publishing some blog articles about the classes and the rest of the retreat soon. Keep an eye on the blog to catch those. For now, I want to introduce a new addition to my YouTube channel, Interviews. As opportunities present themselves, I plan on interviewing various people in the industry. This interview is with Mary Halbrooks, a recent convert to the coffee industry. Mary is a horticulturalist and an educator for the SCA, but even more interesting, she has something new cooking in Costa Rica. In this interview, I wanted to give Mary the opportunity to talk about her recent trip to Costa Rica and share what she learned there, and then talk about her future plans in the world of coffee. So let's get to it. Mary, thank you for meeting with me. I appreciate it. Sure, I'm excited. Yeah, so am I. So you have a very interesting background. You're like me. You're an immigrant to coffee. Mm -hmm. And um, how you got into it, where you came from, and where you're going is all very interesting. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, thank you. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, I was a, a horticulturist. I got my graduate degree in horticulture and kind of went on the university track and climbed the tenure ladder and did all these things. And uh, I enjoyed research, did a lot of field research in vegetable crops, grapes, enology for a lot of years. And then I got more into the teaching side and kind of away from the research because I wanted some time in the summers. I was raising my children, you know. So um, I got more broadly, you know, um, I expanded what I was teaching beyond horticulture. I started teaching environmental biology, general biology, number of things. So I'm sort of a science geek and a horticulture geek, but plants are my first love. So after um, a number of years, I started giving some thought to just doing something else. The academic life was interesting, but not as interesting as it was, you know, at the beginning. So I thought, well, what could I do? So. Um, it just seemed to me that I had always been a coffee geek and a person with a lot of interest in coffee and the more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And because coffee is a horticultural crop, it seemed like a really natural segue for me to, to start, you know, essentially learning everything I could about coffee and then decided that it was also a really natural segue for me to become an educator in coffee. Right. So that's where I am now. Excellent. And we met at the AST course. Yep. Last November. More education, right? Yeah, more education. So authorized specialty coffee association trainers. Yeah. We both are. It's yeah. a mouthful. Yeah. And then you have something going on in Costa Rica, and you have a new partner there, Hortensia. Yes. And this is another very interesting story. Yeah, well, in addition to wanting to teach the sensory module for SCA, um, I knew that to really educate myself, I needed to take the next step. So I went on an origin trip with SCA, and on that origin trip, I met a woman who's Costa Rican, and her name is Hortensia Solis. And I was very interested in her story. She's um, educated in agriculture and coffee, did graduate research in coffee. Uh, it was a project she did in Costa Rica, sponsored by the German government, under the umbrella of NAMA, which is an organization that promotes carbon neutral farming in Costa Rica. Uh, and she's, what she really realized she wanted to do was to set up her own travel business. So she did. It's called Viaje con Café, which means vacation with coffee. And she did a lot of research on the potential for coffee tourism, much like wine tourism, where it started and where it is now. It's, it's a fairly you know, big business worldwide. And she really wanted to take people back to Costa Rica, her home country. So she started, you know, investigating how to set up a travel business. She's currently based in the Netherlands. She was reaching out to people in the UK and Europe and the Middle East. And so when we were talking, I said, well, who's working with you, you in the United States and North America? And she said, nobody. And I said, well, let's do this together. Let's collaborate because I really like what you do and I'm very interested in the fact that you're focused on education at origin, not sourcing. Mm. And all the importers who, you know, offer trips to origin, they're focused on sourcing, developing relationships between a buyer and a producer. Right. And that's great, but that's what they do. And they also, as someone pointed out here at the conference, have limited resources. 
for budgeting that kind of travel. Mm -hmm. So she's focused on education and culture and building relationships based on understanding better what is the producer trying to achieve, why is Costa Rica a special place, because it is very special, and what can we as people in the coffee industry gain from that and bring back to our own coffee businesses. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. I'm very jealous. <laughs> well, join us on a trip. So you have a couple trips coming up. Mm -hmm. You have one in January and one in February, right? That's right. We have a January trip, and that is for the coffee coffee enthusiast or the person who perhaps is just getting their toe into the water of coffee, so to speak. They are interested. Perhaps they want some more knowledge. They're excited about travel to origin, and they might also be interested in, for example, seeing a cacao farm um, and a little more time to go to the beach you know, watch the sunset, eat great food. Uh, whereas the February trip is really for the coffee professional. So we're, we're really moving on that trip. We're seeing three farms a day. We're going to mills in the afternoon. We're cupping. You know, we're getting into long conversations with producers. We're understanding the processing, you know, post-harvest processing and how it affects flavor in the cup. So we have that whole follow through from the seed to the cup all in the seven days. So wow, that's great. So yeah. it's seven full days and you're hitting mm -hmm. about three farms a day. About three farms a day. You are right. moving. Yeah, premier coffee regions of Costa Rica. And because Hortensia grew up there, she has a lot of, you know, relationships already established with people right. in coffee. So. And she speaks the language, so you have a translator. Yeah. She knows the culture. Yeah. And that's really where it is. Mm -hmm. You know, like you were saying, when you have um, sourcing trips, mm -hmm. um, it's easier in the sourcing trips to, to miss some of the really good stuff that you could be getting while you're in origin. Yeah. And with you guys focusing more on culture and more on learning the process mm -hmm. and what it means to the farmers to actually grow that crop and produce mm -hmm. it in tandem with, uh, you know, the West or the buying countries is a little bit more valuable, I think. And I think it is really valuable for me. It was just eye-opening. I mean, as a horticulturist, I loved getting back onto a farm. You know, I, I love stomping fields. So that was, for me, really enriching. But also, we saw small farms where people are managing eight acres, and they, they're trying to achieve the best quality they can, and mm. they're even subdividing those into micro lots. I mean, they go to great lengths in Costa Rica for quality. They are not a quantity country. They, they produce very little of the total percentage of coffee worldwide. So they decided a long time ago, we can differentiate ourselves by focusing on quality. And producers go to great lengths there to do that. So you'll see a small farm and then we'll see larger farms. And we'll see cooperatives where they share the mill and we'll see micro mills on specialty farms where it's all belongs to that estate and they're processing all their own coffees. So um, one of the things that really was surprising to me, for example, was most of the farms, if not all, unless they're very, very small, set aside hundreds of acres for conservation. I mean, the heartbeat sort of of Costa Rica is that the environment, they value it already. They don't need to be convinced. Mm. They know it. Yeah. So they protect their water, they set aside their land. They're proud of it. They're very, very proud. 200 acres starts right there. Yeah. All of that is set Untouched. aside for the birds and the That's great. bees. So and do they do a lot of um, uh, forestry farming where the, the trees are in with the natural forest? Or do they, is it more a lot of rows? You have a coffee tree and then you have the shade tree rows and then you have a row of coffee trees. The, the farms that we saw that were utilizing shade to get higher quality um, were interspersing uh, native trees. So when they planted or replanted, they tended to conserve the native trees. And if they did plant trees, they were trees that they knew um, were, in, were either native and being reintroduced in other words, they weren't growing there at the time, you know, that the coffee was, um, they may have planted it, but it was still a native tree. Mm -hmm. And trees that also they knew were compatible with coffee yeah. in some way. So um, the, we saw some intercropping as well, but mm -hmm. there isn't, the, there are rows, the coffee does grow in rows, 
because they have to be able to move up and down the rows efficiently for picking mm -hmm. or fertilizing or whatever management practices. But not it's not large scale at all, like for example Brazil. Right. Right. And a lot of it's terraced on the mountainside. So I bet that's beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Now, my experience in Indonesia has been kind of a mixed bag as well. Mm -hmm. So you'll find like in Bali, for example, you'll find one farmer who's just planted his trees out underneath the, uh, the natural forest. Mm -hmm. They aren't organized, they aren't in rows. Oh, they're all in one area, okay. but they're out with the trees that were there. And then you'll see another guy who has, he's cleared a whole area. And they usually start by planting uh, in this one region, oranges. Okay. Uh, they're the intercropping crop. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll let the oranges go for two years and then they'll plant the coffee in behind mm -hmm. that. So the oranges will grow for two years, they'll start producing. And the oranges are actually a better money crop than hmm. coffee. Yeah, and I think there are some farms, farms in Costa Rica where avocados are more profitable than the coffee. No. I mean, it's it's not a luxurious situation. There are some beautiful farms, uh, family estates that have been handed down where there is more affluence behind the coffee. But there are also many small farms where the farmers are barely making a profit and they're willing to work very hard to for the potential of making more but very often it's because they have a diversity of other crops that they're actually having to grow they don't have the luxury of growing only coffee yeah so and you and i talked a little bit earlier about um it would be nice this was something that you had mentioned that i thought was a great idea it would be nice if we had kind of a floor price for mm -hmm. specialties can you talk a little bit more about that that's actually something I learned from a woman named Marianella Jost, and she has uh, bought a farm after many years of living in the States, Costa Rica, and went back to Costa Rica, decided that she would pursue coffee farming. And she bought a farm called Cafe Con Amor, and realized quickly the struggles that most of the farmers in her area faced. And so uh, we had a discussion at the Buckman Coffee Factory of Portland after the SCA Expo, she was presenting there with some of her other farmer colleagues, uh, and the group they have formed is called Farmers Project. So if you're interested in reading more about it, you can go to Cafe Kona Moore and look for her page. Sorry, we have some insights. Yeah. Um, her page on Farmers Project. So they're actually importing their own, and the reason they are is because her argument is, and it's a very solid one, and I keep reading more about it so I know she knows what she's talking about, um, is that the floor price in the in the, the C, what they call the C price or the commodity exchange mm -hmm. price for coffee does not reflect the amount of effort and work and uh, investment that goes into specialty coffee because we define specialty coffee as anything that scores on an SCA cupping or evaluation of 80 and above. Why are we talking about a C price of a dollar, which has just dropped to a dollar, for producers who are distinguishing themselves as always scoring 80 and above? And the C market was designed for coffee seen as a commodity, which is like talking about grain or corn mm -hmm. or other agronomic crops. Clearly, this is a specialty horticultural crop. You offer much more per pound for lettuce or grapes than you do for grain. And yet in coffee, here we are in this antiquated system, in my opinion, and I think a lot of other people are already saying this, not just me. Here we have a C price for generic, agronomic, bulk, commodity crops, and we're applying it to the price we're paying growers, and at the same time, we want them to produce specialty coffee that scores 80 and above. And we can't tell them what that was, what the value of that is for no, us. No, unless they are lucky enough to win a cup of excellence auction, or if they are able to establish, for example, a relationship with some yeah. buyers that have made a commitment to not go under. There are a few buyers who are signing on to a commitment. We will pay no less than 235 an hour, I mean, a pound green. Things like that, like Kickapoo Coffee mm -hmm. in Wisconsin has made a commitment. They never offer less than a certain price. So that's the kind of change that is incremental, and I think it's going to have to happen because they also tell me that in Costa Rica, the young folks don't want to take on the coffee farming. They've seen their parents 
um, struggle with, so they're leaving the farm. Yeah, that's one of the things we talked about in Colombia at the World Coffee Producers Forum, mm -hmm. was generational takeover. Yeah. And how do you make it more appealing for the next generation when they have so much available to them now, especially in the cities? Yeah, and, and the money's difficult. just not there. The only thing yeah. that would really turn it around is if they started seeing that they could earn good, a good wage, you know, and have yeah. a good living, a good standard of living. And I think Costa Rica is going down a good track for them in that regard, where they're mm -hmm. pulling in ecotourism or yeah. coffee tourism into mm -hmm. it, so that you can bolt things yeah. on to the farming aspect. And I personally think modernizing farming more would help bring in the next generation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we in the specialty coffee industry, we like to see things metered. We like to see things measured and accurate and precise. Right. And to achieve that, you need to bring in technology. You need mm -hmm. to bring in some knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the tricky part is supplanting some of the tradition with modern techniques and not erasing what you know what their generations before them did mm -hmm. but improving it and it's difficult i think some of that is happening there were a couple of places that we visited that are um there is a place called gaia and they are essentially kind of doing what you're talking about they're establishing what's called a demonstration farm and we were able to visit them now they haven't it's not very far along we have i have some pictures um, on my um, from my from my journey, and I can post them on my pay on my um, website. But um, at the Gaia demonstration farm, they're trying to not only put in cultivars that they're they're trying to look at cultivars that are actually adapted to different regions of Costa Rica, and now they're also trying to look at best farming practices, and they're also looking at um, putting investment into propagation of hybrids. So that you know, tissue culture and, and other micro propagation techniques that will allow farmers to bring in hybrids, because we know that a lot of the currently popular cultivars are rust are not rust resistant. Rust susceptible. Rust, yeah, and so this disease, of course, as you know, has wiped out a, a lot of yeah. a lot of the crops. So, so there there is some of that going on in Costa Rica, and there are some very modern agronomists who are doing really good work there, and they're trying to bring up, you know, the level of technology on the farm. Um, for example, one of the farms we visited, that is Hacienda Tobosi, uh, they have thermocouples throughout their farm. They're constantly managing the farm and seeing where they're having problems with heat, um, because, and that's why they did a lot, they're doing a lot of work with shade. They mm -hmm. want to see how much quality improvement in the fruit they can get from shade, and one way to measure shade is temperature. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking all throughout their farm and seeing where they have shade and where they don't and what the temperature differences are. And then they follow that all the way to the cup. Wow. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. So there's some of that going on. Yeah. Yeah. We need to spread that around. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate it. You have, uh, there's another class that's getting ready to yeah. start and it's mm -hmm. the Women in Roasters. So I wanna, yeah, I want to go to that. I want to get yeah. you free so that you can go to that. Okay. Thank thanks. you very much. I appreciate Thanks, it. thanks Mike. I like it. It's right. fun. I had a good time. I did too.